chapter 1, and the very famous words of verses 1, 20. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that light was the life of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of the fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Imagine the last time you were in a big crowd. Actually, if you're um, claustrophobic, don't. But, uh, <laughs> but otherwise... Imagine the last time you were surrounded by throngs of people, whether that was in a shopping centre, or at an airport, or in the Boxing Day sales, or wherever it was, and there were seemingly hundreds of people all milling about, uh, making a noise, uh, constantly active. Think about all those people, every one unique, all with their own lives and their own abilities and their own problems and their own joys, all different. What difference would it make to each of those person, those people, to know that they are seen by God, that they are beheld in God's gaze, that God knows everything about them, that nothing they have ever done, nothing that they are, is unknown to God. And God doesn't just know them, but loves them <laughs> and wants to transform their lives. What difference would it make to each one of those people if they realized that that was true? Well, as John does, let's go back, right back to the beginning. At the point where God brings the world into being. And it's not that God was bored and decided
decided to do something to occupy himself. God always knew. God always had in his mind a world that he would bring into being. And as God is love, you could say that the world was created out of love. Even before the beginning, though, God knew us. God doesn't make things up as he goes along. We were known and loved by God before we were born. In fact, even before the world began. He knew when we would enter the world and when we would depart from it. We exist only because he decided that we should exist. We have nothing that doesn't come from him. We owe our very existence to him. Although that doesn't stop us sometimes from feeling that we can live without him, that we can be self-sufficient. Human beings have always used their God-given free will to try to live independently from God. And when people do that, when they decide to cut themselves off from the only real source of life and goodness and truth, then of course things will go wrong. We are created to live in relationship with God and when people reject that relationship, their lives are forever out of kilter. Things aren't as they're supposed to be. But that's not the whole story because God's love is indestructible. And although the more we wander away from God, the more people reject him and try to either create their own gods or try to live as if they are God, eventually a miasma of sin surrounds us such that it obscures God completely. We get lost and there's no way back, except that in our hopelessness, God approached us, speaking to us in the language that we understand, the language of flesh and blood. God stood amongst us in Jesus Christ. And even then, even when God was standing in our midst, people rejected him. Even when God was visible in front of them, people chose to walk away. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if someone is hardened against God, they won't see God, whatever God might do. God may know us and love us, but that's not enough. Sometimes people talk as if the fact that God loves us is enough. God loves us as we are, and therefore is happy for us to do whatever, to live however we choose. And even if we ignore him completely, God will still love us and everything will be fine. That's not really how it works, because even though God loves us, we have to respond. God never forces himself on us. God never coerces us. God reaches out to us and we are called to respond. We have to choose. We have to let Jesus lead us back to God. And when we do that, we begin to know God. Not just know about God. There are any number of people uh, who know, have all sorts of theories about God, who have their own ideas about God, who spend their lives uh, in academic study of the Bible. But that's not the same as knowing God. You can read a history book about a famous person, say Henry VIII, and by the time you get to the end of the book you know all about Henry VIII, but that's not the same as actually knowing Henry VIII, although I don't think I'd want to. But, um, 
calls us to know him. We can never know God as he knows us, but we can get much closer than we think. God calls us to know him in the way that we know a close friend or a loved one. And that's not all. We can not only know God, but we can be transformed by the love in which we have chosen to dwell. And that's why becoming a Christian is only the beginning. We are called not just to believe that God loves us, but to constantly reset our lives, to keep coming back to the love which is now, which is now the bedrock of our lives, and to be restored and renewed and healed and cleansed and brought back to where we should be. Now, if this sermon sounds slightly more polished than normal, it's because I preached it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I preached it in a church hall because the uh, sanctuary was being um, renovated, redecorated. Uh, so we all squashed together in the church hall. And it made me think about how buildings uh, need constant attention. Paint peels and fades and stone cracks and dust accumulates. Keeping a building in good condition is a never-ending job. And it's like that with our spiritual lives. Our relationship with God is something which has to be nurtured constantly. As we constantly allow the Spirit to flow into our lives as we constantly learn how to be open to God in every area of our lives. Not simply to drift along and invite God in when we feel like it, but to lay the whole of our lives before him. To be willing to be renewed and restored, to conform ever more closely to the likeness of Christ, to come back to where we should be. As I heard somebody once put it, that in our spiritual life, we haven't got the option of staying still. If, if we're not going forward, then we're going backwards. And we all drift. We're all human. We all have a tendency to wander off. But often, we don't realise we're wandering. We don't realise that, as in the uh, parable of the sower, with the seed that falls amongst weeds, the worries and cares and concerns of life, or the constant things that bombard us and demand our attention, choke us, and God gets pushed out. And as we drift, other non-godly influences begin to dominate our minds and slowly we start to speak and to think and to act out of our accommodation with the world rather than out of the influence of God and his spirit in our lives. So we're called to come back constantly to those words from Isaiah 51. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. God knows us intimately. That's a given. But life, real life, and hope, and purpose, and meaning in life, only really begin to be found when we open ourselves to knowing God in return, in an ongoing encounter in which we learn and grow going from one degree of glory to another, discovering grace a 